The Pharsalia by Lucan Translated by Sir Edward Ridley, 1896 Book Six The Flight Near Dyrrachium Skeva's Exploits The Witch of Thessalia Now that the chiefs, with minds intent on fight, had drawn their armies near upon the hills, and all the gods beheld their chosen pair, Caesar, the Grecian towns despising, scorned to reap the glory of successful war, save at his kinsman's cost, in all his prayers. He seeks that moment, fatal to the world, when shall be cast the die to win or lose, and all his fortune hang upon the throw. Thrice he drew out his troops, his eagles thrice, demanding battle, thus to increase the woe of Latium, prompt as ever, but his foes, proof against every art, refused to leave the rampart of their camp. Then, marching swift, by hidden path between the wooded fields, he seeks and hopes to seize Dyrrachium's fort. But Magnus, speeding by the ocean marge, first camped on Petra's slopes, a rocky hill, thus by the natives named. From thence he keeps, watch o'er the fortress of Corinthian birth, which by its towers alone, without a guard, was safe against a siege. No hand of man in ancient days built up her lofty wall. No hammer rang upon her massive stones. Not all the works of war, nor time himself, shall undermine her. Nature's hand has raised her adamantine rocks, and hedged her in, with bulwarks girded by the foamy main. And but for one short bridge of narrow earth, Dyrrachium were an island, steep and fierce, dreaded of sailors are the cliffs that bear her walls, and tempests howling from the west toss up the raging main upon the roofs, and how homes and temples tremble at the shock. Thirsting for battle and with hopes inflamed, here Caesar hastes with distant rampart lines, seeking unseen to coop his foe within, though spread in spacious camp upon the hills. With eagle eye he measures out the land, meet to be compassed, nor content with turf. Fit for a hasty mound, he bids his troops tear from the quarries many a giant rock, and spoils the dwellings of the Greeks, and drags their walls asunder for his own. Thus rose a mighty barrier, which no ram could burst, nor any ponderous machine of war. Mountains are cleft, and level through the hills, the work of Caesar strides, wide yawns the moat. Forts show their towers rising on the heights, and in vast circle forests are enclosed, and groves and spacious lands and beasts of prey, as in a line of toils. Pompeius lacks nor field nor forage in the encircled span, nor room to move his camp. Nay, rivers rose within and ran their course and reached the sea. And Caesar wearied ere he saw the whole, and daylight failed him. Let the ancient tale attribute to the labors of the gods the walls of Ilium. Let the fragile bricks which compass in great Babylon amaze the fleeting Parthian. Here a larger space than those great cities which Orontes swift and Tigris' stream enclose, or that which boasts in eastern climes the lordly palaces fit for Assyria's kings, is closed by walls, amid the haste and tumult of a war, thorst to completion. Yet this labor huge was spent in vain. So many hands had joined or Sestos with Abydos, or had tamed with mighty mole the Hellespontine wave, or Corinth from the realm of Pelops' king had rent asunder, or had spared each ship her voyage round the long Malayan cape or had done anything most hard to change the world's created surface. Here the war was prisoned, blood predestinate to flow in all the parts of earth, the host foredoomed to fall in Libya or in Thessaly was here, in such small amphitheater the tide of civil passion rose and fell. At first Pompeius knew not, so the hind, who peaceful tills the mid Sicilian fields, hears not Pelorus sounding up to the storm. So billows thunder on Rutupian shores, unheard by distant Caledonia's tribes. 
But when he saw the mighty barrier stretch O'er hill and valley, and enclose the land, He bade his columns leave their rocky hold, And seize on points of vantage in the plain, Thus forcing Caesar to extend his troops On wider lines, and holding for his own Such space encompassed as divides from Rome Aresia, sacred to that goddess chaste Of old Mycenae, or as Tiber holds, from Rome's high ramparts to the Tuscan sea, unless he deviate, no bugle call, commands an onset, and the darts that fly, fly though forbidden, but the arm that flings, for proof the lance at random here and there, deals impious slaughter, weighty care compelled, each leader to withhold his troops from fight. For there the weary earth of produce failed, Pressed by Pompeia's steeds, whose horny hoofs Rang in their gallop on the grassy fields, And killed the succulents. They strengthless lay upon the mown expanse, Nor pile of straw, brought from full barns In place of living grass, relieved their craving, Shook their panting flanks, and as they wheeled, Death struck his victim down. Then foul contagion filled the murky air, whose poisonous weight pressed on them in a cloud, pestiferous, as in Nisus' isle the breath of Styx rolls upward from the mist-clad rocks, or that fell vapor which the caves exhale from Typhon raging in the depths below. Then died the soldier, for the streams they drank held yet more poison than the air. The skin was dark and rigid, and the fiery plague made hard their vitals, and with pitiless tooth gnawed at their wasted features, while their eyes started from out their sockets, and the head drooped for sheer weariness. So the disease grew swifter in its strides, till scarce was room twixt life and death for sickness, and the pest slew as it struck its victim, and the dead thrust from the tents, such all their burial lay, blent with the living. Yet their camp was pitched hard by the breezy sea, by which might come all nations' harvests, and the northern wind not seldom rolled the murky air away. Their foe, not vexed with pestilential air, nor stagnant waters, ample range enjoyed upon the spacious uplands, yet as though in leaguer famine seized them for its prey. Scarce were the crops half grown when Caesar saw how prone they seized upon the feed food of beasts, and stripped of leaves the bushes and the groves, and dragged from roots unknown the doubtful herb. Thus ate they starving, all that teeth may bite, or fire might soften, or might pass their throats, dry, parched, abraded, food unknown before, nor placed on tables, while the leaguered foe was blessed with plenty. When Pompeius first was pleased to break his bonds and be at large, no sudden dash he makes on sleeping foe, unarmed in shade of night. His mighty soul scorns such a path to victory. Twas his aim to lay the turrets low, to mark his track by ruin spread afar, and with the sword to hew a path between his slaughtered foes. Minutius' turret was the chosen spot, where groves of trees and thickets gave approach, safe, unbetrayed by dust. Up from the fields flashed all at once his eagles into sight, and all his trumpets blared, but ere the sword could win the battle, on the hostile ranks dread panic fell, prone as in death they lay, where else upright they should withstand the foe, nor more availed their valor, and in vain the cloud of weapons flew with none to slay. Then blazing torches rolling pitchy flame are hurled, and shaken, nod the lofty towers, and threaten ruin, and the bastions groan, struck by the frequent engine, and the troops of Magnus, by triumphant eagles led, stride, stride o'er the rampart, in their front the world. Yet now that passage, which not Caesar's self, nor thousand valiant squadrons had availed to rescue from their grasp, one man in arms, steadfast till death refused them. Scava named this hero-soldier. Long he served in fight, waged against the savage on the banks of Rome. And now, centurion made, through deeds of blood, he bore the staff before the marshaled line. 
prone to all wickedness he little recked how valorous deeds in civil war may be greatest of crimes and when he saw how turned his comrades from the war and sought in flight a refuge whence he cried this impious fear unknown to caesar's armies do ye turn your backs on death and are ye not ashamed not to be found where slaughtered heroes lie is loyalty too weak yet love of fight might bid you stand we are the chosen few through whom the foe would break unbought by blood this day shall not be theirs neath caesar's eye true death would be more happy but this boon fortune denies at least my fall shall be praised by pompeius break ye with your breasts their weapons blunt the edges of their swords with throats unyielding in the distant lines the dust is seen already and the sound of tumult and of ruin finds the ear of caesar strike the victory is ours for he shall come who while his soldiers die shall make the fortress his his voice called forth the courage that the trumpets failed to rouse when first they rang his comrades mustering come to watch his deeds and wondering at the man to test if valor thus by foes oppressed in narrow space could hope for aught but death but Skeva, standing on the tottering bank heaves from the brimming turret on the foe the corpses of the fallen the ruined mass furnishing weapons to his hands with beams and ponderous stones nay with his body threats his enemies with poles and stakes he thrusts the breasts advancing when they grasp the wall he lops the arm rocks crush the foeman's skull and rive the scalp asunder fiery bolts dashed at another set his hair aflame till rolls the greedy blaze about his eyes with hideous crackle as the pile of slain rose to the summit of the wall he sprang swift as across the nets a hunted pard above the swords upraised till in mid throng of foes he stood hemmed in by densest ranks and ramparted by war in front and rear where'er he struck the victor now his sword blunted with gore congealed no more could wound but break the stricken limb while every hand flung every quivering dart at him alone nor missed their aim for rang against his shield dart after dart unerring and his helm in broken fragments pressed upon his brow his vital parts were safeguarded by spears that bristled in his body fortune saw thus waged a novel combat for their ward against one man an army why with darts madmen assail him and with slender shafts against which his life is proof or ponderous stones this warrior chief shall overwhelm or bolts flung by the twisted thongs of mighty slings let steel-shod ram or catapult remove this champion of the gate no fragile wall stands here for caesar blocking with its bulk pompeius way to freedom now he trusts his shield no more lest his sinister hand idle give life by shame and on his breast bearing a forest of spears though spent with toil and worn with onset falls upon his foe and braves alone the wounds of all the war thus may an elephant in afric wastes oppressed by frequent darts break those that fall rebounding from his horny hide and shake those that find lodgment while his life within lies safe protected nor doth spear avail to reach the fount of blood unnumbered wounds by arrow dealt or lance thus fail to slay this single warrior but lo from far a cretan archer's shaft more sure of aim than vows could hope for strikes on skeva's brow to light within his eye the hero tugs intrepid bursts the nerve and tears the shaft forth with the eyeball and with dauntless heel treads them to dust not otherwise a bear pannonian fiercer for the wound received maddened by dart from libyan thong and propelled turns circling on her wound and still pursues the weapon fleeing as she whirls around thus in his rage destroyed his shapeless face stood foul with crimson flow the victor's shout glad to the sky arose no greater joy a little blood could give them had they seen 
that Caesar's self was wounded. Down he pressed, deep in his soul the anguish, and with mien, no longer bent on flight, submissive cried, Spare me, ye citizens, remove the war, far hence, no weapons now can haste my death. Draw from my breast the darts, but add no more. Yet raise me up to place me in the camp of Magnus, living, this your gift to him. No brave man's death my title to renown, but Caesar's flag deserted. So he spake. Unhappy Aulus thought his words were true, nor saw within his hand the pointed sword, and leaping forth in haste to make his own, the prisoner and his arms, in middle throat, received the lightning blade. By this one death, rose Scava's valor again, and thus he cried, Such be the punishment of all who thought great Scava vanquished. If Pompeius seeks peace from this reeking sword, lo, let him lay at Caesar's feet his standards. Me, do you think, such as yourselves, and slow to meet the fates? Your love for Magnus and the Senate's cause is less than mine for death. These were his words, and dust in columns proved that Caesar came. Thus was Pompeius' glory spared the stain of flight compelled by Scava. He, when ceased, the battle fell, no more by rage of fight, or sight of blood outpouring from his wounds, roused to the combat. Fainting, there he lay, upon the shoulders of his comrades born, who him adoring as though deity dwelt in his bosom, for his matchless deeds plucked forth the gory shafts and took his arms to deck the gods and shield the breast of Mars. Thrice happy thou, with such a name achieved, had but the fierce Iberian from thy sword, or heavy-shielded Teuton, or had fled the light Cantabrian, with no spoil shalt thou adorn the thunderer's temple, nor upraise the shout of triumph in the ways of Rome. For all thy prowess, all thy deeds of pride, do but prepare her lord. Nor on this hand, repulsed, Pompeius idly ceased from war, content within his bars, but, as the sea, tireless, which tempests force upon the crag that breaks it, or which gnaws a mountain-side, some day to fall in ruin on itself. He sought the turrets nearest to the main, on double onset bent, nor closely kept his troops in hand, but on the spacious plain spread forth his camp. They joyful lead the tents, and wander at their will. Thus Padus flows, in brimming flood, and foaming at his bounds, making whole districts quake, and should the bank Fail neath his swollen waters, all his stream, Breaks forth in swirling eddies over fields, Not his before. Some lands are lost, the rest gain from his bounty. Hardly from his tower had Caesar seen the fire, Or known the fight, and coming found the rampart overthrown. The dust no longer stirred, the rains cold, As from a battle done, the peace that reigned, there and on Magnus' side, as though men slept, their victory won, aroused his angry soul. Quick he prepares, so that he end their joy, careless of slaughter or defeat, to rush with threatening columns on Torquatus' post. But swift as sailor, by his trembling mast, warned of Circean tempest, furls his sails, so swift Torquatus saw, and prompt to wage the war more closely, he withdrew his men, within a narrower wall. Now past the trench were Caesar's companies, when from the hills Pompeius hurled his host upon their ranks, shut in and hampered, not so much o'erwhelmed as Caesar's soldiers as the hind who dwells on Etna's slopes, when blows the southern wind, and all the mountain pours its cauldrons forth upon the vale, and huge Enceladus, writhing beneath his load, spouts o'er the plains a blazing torrent. Blinded by the dust, encircled, vanquished, ere the fight they fled, in cloud of terror on their rearward foe, so rushing on their fates. Thus had the war shed its last drop of blood, and peace ensued. But Magnus suffered not, and held his troops back from the battle. 
Thou, O Rome, hadst been free, happy, mistress of thy laws and rights, were Sala here. Now shalt thou ever grieve that in his crowning crime to have met in fight a pious kinsman Caesar's vantage lay. O oh, tragic destiny, nor Munda's fight, Hispania had wept, nor Libya mourned, in crimson Utica, nor Nilus stream, with blood unspeakable polluted, borne a nobler course than her Egyptian kings. Nor Juba lain unburied on the sands, nor Scipio with his blood outpoured appeased the ghosts of Carthage, nor the blameless life of Cato ended, and Pharsalia's name had then been blotted from the book of fate. But Caesar left the region where his arms had found the deities averse, and marched his shattered columns to Thessalian lands. Then to Pompeius came, whose mind was bent, to follow Caesar wheresoe'er he fled, his captains striving to persuade their chief to seek Ausonia, his native land, now freed from foes. Ne'er will I pass, he said, my country's limit, nor revisit Rome, like Caesar, at the head of banded hosts. Hesperia, when the war began, was mine. Mine had I chosen in our country's shrines, in midmost forum of her capital, to join the battle. So that banished far, be war from Rome, I'll cross the torrid zone, or those forever frozen Scythian shores. What, shall my victory rob thee of the peace I gave thee by my flight? Rather than thou, shouldst feel the evils of this impious war, let Caesar deem thee his. Thus said his course, he turned towards the rising of the sun, and following devious paths through forest wide, made for Amathia, the land by fate, foredoomed to see the issue. Thessalia on that side where Titan first raises the wintry day, by Asa's rocks is prisoned in, but in the advancing year, when higher in the vault his chariot rides, tis Pelion that meets the morning rays. And when beside the lion's flames he drives the middle course, Othrys with woody top, screens his chief ardor. On the hither side, Pindus receives the breezes of the west, and as the evening falls brings darkness in. There too Olympus, at whose foot who dwells, nor fears the north, nor sees the shining bear. Between these mountains hemmed, in ancient time, the fields were marsh, for Tempe's pass not yet was cleft to give an exit to the streams that filled the plains, but when Alcides hand smote Ossa from Olympus at a blow, and Nereus wondered at the sudden flood of waters to the main, then on the shore would it had slept forever neath the deep. Sea-born Achilles' home, Pharsalus rose, and Philasse, whence sailed that ship of old, whose keel first touched upon the beach at Troy. And Dorian, mournful for the muse's ire, on Thamyris vanquished, Trachis, Melibe, strong in the shafts of Hercules, the price of that most awful torch. Larissa's hold, potent of yore, and Argos, famous erst, o'er which men pass the plowshare, and the spot, fabled as Echionian Thebes, where once Agave bore in exile to the pyre. Grieving, t'was all she had, the head and neck of Pentheus massacred. The lake set free, flowed forth in many rivers, to the west, Aeus, a gentle stream, nor stronger flows the sire of Isis, ravished from his arms, and Achilleus, rival for the hand of Oaneus' daughter, rules his earthy flood to silt the shore beside the neighboring isles. A Venice, purpled by the centaur's blood, wanders through Caledon in the Malian Gulf. Thy rapids fall, Spercaeus, pure the wave with which Amphrysos irrigates the meads where once Apollo served. A Nauris flows, breathing no vapor forth, no humid air, ripples his face, and whatever stream, nameless itself, to ocean gives its waves through thee, Peneus. 
whirled in eddies foams. Apidanus, Anipius lingers on, swift only when fresh streams his volume swell, and thus Asopus takes his ordered course, Phoenix and Melas, but Eurotas keeps, his stream aloof from that with which he flows, Peneus gliding on his top as though upon the channel. Fable says that, sprung from darkest pools of sticks, with common floods, he scorns to mingle, mindful of his source, so that the gods above may fear him still. Soon as were sped the rivers, Boebian ploughs, dark with its riches, broke the virgin soil. Then came Lelegians to press the share, and Dolopes and sons of Oeloas, by whom the glebe was furrowed, Steed-renowned Magnesians drew the, dwelt there, and the minion race, who smote the sounding billows with the oar. There in the cavern from the pregnant cloud, Ixion's sons found birth, the centaur brood, half beast, half human. Monicus, who broke the su stubborn rocks of Foloe, Roetus fierce, hurling from Oeta's top gigantic elms, which northern storms could hardly overturn. Pholus, Alcides' host, Nessus who bore the queen across a Venice waves to feel the deadly arrow for his shameful deed, and aged Chiron, who with wintry star against the huger scorpion draws his bow. Here sparkled on the land the warrior seed, here leaped the charger from Thessalian rocks, struck by the trident of the ocean king, omen of dreadful war. Here first he learned, champing the bit and foaming at the curb, yet to obey his lord. From yonder shore the keel of pine first floated, and bore men to dare the perilous chance of seas unknown. And here Ionus, ruler of the land, first from the furnace molten masses drew of iron and brass. Here first the hammer fell, to weld them, shapeless. Here in glowing stream ran silver forth and gold, soon to receive the minting stamp. Twas thus that money came, whereby men count their riches, cause accursed of warfare. Hence came down that python huge on Kira, hence the laurel wreath which crowns the Pythian victor. Here Aloeus' sons, gigantic, rose against the gods, what time Pelion had almost touched the stars supreme and Asa's loftier peak amid the sky, opposing, barred the constellation's way. When in this fated land the chiefs had placed their several camps, foreboding of the end, now fast approaching, all men's thoughts were turned upon the final issue of the war. And as the hour drew near, the coward minds, trembling beneath the shadow of the fate, now hanging o'er them, deemed disaster near. While some took heart, yet doubted what might fall, in hope and fear alternate, mid the throng, Sextus, unworthy son of worthy sire, who soon upon the waves that Scylla guards, Sicilian pirate, exile from his home, stained by his deeds of shame the fights he won, could bear delay no more, his feeble soul, Sick of uncertain fate, by fear compelled, forecast the future, yet consulted not the shrine of Delos nor the Pythian caves, nor was he satisfied to learn the sound of Jove's brass cauldron mid Dodona's oaks, by her primeval fruits the nurse of men, nor sought he sages who by flight of birds, or watching with Assyrian care the stars and fires of heaven, or by vi victims slain, may know the fates to come, nor any source, lawful though secret, for to him was known that which excites the hate of gods above, magician's lore, the savage creed of Dis, and all the shades, and sad with gloomy rites, mysterious altars. For his frenzied soul, heaven knew too little, and the spot itself kindled his madness, for hard by there dwelt the brood of Haman, whom no storied witch of fiction e'er transcended, all their art in things most strange and most incredible. 
There were Thessalian rocks with deadly herbs, thick-planted, sensible to magic chance, venereal, secret, and the land was full of violence to the gods. The queenly guest from Colchis gathered here the fatal roots that were not in her store. Hence vain to heaven rise impious incantations, all unheard. For deaf the ears divine, save for one voice, which penetrates the furthest depths of airs, compelling e'en the unwilling deities to hearken to its accents. Not the care of the revolving sky or starry pole can call them from it ever. Once the sound of those dread tones unspeakable has reached the constellations, then nor Babylon nor secret Memphis, though they open wide the shrines of ancient magic and entreat the gods, could draw them from the fires that smoke upon the altars of far Thessaly. To hearts of flint those incantations bring love, strange, unnatural. The old man's breast burns with illicit fire, nor lies the power in harmful cup, nor in the juicy pledge of love maternal from the forehead drawn. Charmed forth by spells alone the mind decays, by poisonous drugs unharmed. With woven threads, crossed in mysterious fashion, do they bind those whom no passion born of beauteous form or loving couch unites. All things on earth change at their bidding. Night usurps the day. The heavens disobey their wonted laws. At that dread hymn the universe stands still, and Jove, while urging the revolving wheels, wonders they move not. Torrents are outpoured beneath a burning sun, and thunder roars, uncaused by Jupiter. From their flowing locks, vapors immense shall issue at their call. When falls the tempest, seas shall rise in foam, moved by their spell, though powerless the breeze to raise the billows. Ships against the wind, with bellying sails, move onward. From the rock hangs motionless the torrent. Rivers run Uphill, the summer's heat no longer swells, Nile in his course, Meander's stream is straight, Slow Rhone is quickened by the rush of Seon, Hills dip their heads and topple to the plain, Olympus sees his clouds drift overhead, And sunless city as sempiternal snows Melt in midwinter, The inflowing tides, driven onward by the moon, At that dread chant, ebb from their course. Earth's axes, else unmoved, have trembled, and the force centripetal has tottered, and the earth's compacted frame, struck by their voice, has gaped, till through the void men saw the moving sky. All beasts most fierce and savage fear them, yet with deadly aid, furnish the witch's arts. Tigers athirst for blood, and noble lions on them fawn with bland caresses. Serpents at their word uncoil their circles, and extended glide along the surface of the frosty field. The viper's severed body joins anew, and dies the snake by human venom slain. Whence comes this labor on the gods, compelled to hearken to the magic chant and spells, nor daring to despise them? Doth some bond control the deities? Is their pleasure so? Or must they listen, and have silent threats prevailed, or piety of unseen received so great a guerdon? Against all the gods is this their influence, or on one alone, who to his will constrains the universe, himself constrained? Stars most in we yonder climb shoot headlong from the zenith, and the moon, gliding serene upon her nightly course, is shorn of luster by their poisonous chant, dimmed by dark earthly fires, as though our orb shadowed her brother's radiance and barred the light bestowed by heaven, nor freshly shines, until descending nearer to the earth, she sheds her baneful drops upon the mead. End of Part One of Book Six